William's New Year's Day by Rich Crompton. William went whistling down the street, his hands in his pockets. William's whistle was more penetrating than melodious. Sensitive people fled, shuddering at the sound. The proprietor of the sweet shop, however, was not sensitive. He nodded affably as William passed. William was a regular customer of his, as regular, that is, as a wholly inadequate allowance would admit. Encouraged, William paused at the doorway and ceased to whistle. "'Hello, Mr. Moss,' he said. "'Hello, William,' said Mr. Moss. "'Anything cheap today?' went on William, hopefully. Mr. Moss shook his head. Two pence an ounce cheapest, he said. William sighed. <sighs> That's awful dear, he said. What isn't dear? Tell me that. What isn't dear? said Mr. Moss, lugubriously. Well, give me two ounces and I'll pay you tomorrow, said William casually. Mr. Moss shook his head. Go on, said William. I get my money tomorrow. You know I get my money tomorrow. Cash, young sir said Mr. Moss heavily. My terms is cash. However, he relented, I'll give you a few over when the scales is down tomorrow for a New Year's gift. Honest Injun? Honest Injun. Give me them now, then, said William. Mr. Moss hesitated. There wouldn't be no New Year's gift, then, would they? He said. William considered. I'll eat them today, but I'll think about them tomorrow. He promised. That'll make him a New Year's gift. Mr. Moss took out a handful of assorted fruit drops and passed them to William. William received them gratefully. And what good resolution are you going to make tomorrow? Went on Mr. Moss. William crunched in silence for a minute. Then, good resolution? He questioned. I ain't got none. You've got to have a good resolution for New Year's Day said Mr. Moss firmly. Same as giving up sugaring tea in Lent and wearing blue on Oxford and Cambridge boat race day, said William with interest. Yes, same as that. Well, you've got to think of some fault you'd like to cure and start tomorrow. William pondered. Can't think of anything, he said at last. You think of something for me. You might take one to do your schoolwork properly he suggested. William shook his head. Nah, that wouldn't be much fun, would it? Crumbs it would. Or to keep your clothes tidy, went on his friend. William shuddered at the thought. Or to give up shouting and whistling. William crammed two more sweets into his mouth and shook his head very firmly. Crumbs enough, he ejaculated indistinctly. Ought to be polite. Polite? Yes. Please. And thank you. And if you don't mind me saying so. And if you excuse me contradicting of you, can I do anything for you? And such like. William was struck with this. Yeah. I might be that. He said. He straightened his collar and stood up. Yeah. I might try being that. How long has it to go on, though? Not long, said Mr. Moss. Only the first day, generally. Folks generally give them up after that. Mr. Moss looked around his little shop with the air of a conspirator, then leant forward, confidentially. I'm going to ask her again, he said. Who? Oh, said William, mystified. Someone I've asked. Regular. Every New Year's Day for ten year. Asked what? said William, gazing sadly at his last sweet. Asked her to take me, of course, said Mr. Morse, with an air of contempt for William's want of intelligence. Take you where? said William. Where do you want to go? Why can't you go yourself? To marry me, I means, said Mr. Moss blushing slightly as he spoke. Well, said William with a judicial air, 
I wouldn't last the same one for ten years. I'd have tried someone else. I'd have gone on asking other people if I wanted to get married. You'd be sure to find someone that wouldn't mind you with a sweet shop, too. She must be a softy. Does she know you've got a sweet shop? Mr. Moss merely sighed and popped a bullseye into his mouth with an air of abstracted melancholy. The next morning, William leapt out of bed with an expression of stern resolve. I'm going to be polite, he remarked to his bedroom furniture. I'm going to be polite all day. He met his father on the stairs as he went down to breakfast. Good morning, father, he said with what he fondly imagined to be a courtly manner. Can I do anything for you today? His father looked down at him suspiciously. What do you want now? he demanded. William was hurt. I'm only being polite. It's, you know, one of those things you take on New Year's Day. Well, I've took one to be polite. His father apologised. I'm sorry, he said. You see, I'm not used to it. It startled me. At breakfast, William's politeness shone forth in all its glory. Can I pass you anything, Robert? he said sweetly. His elder brother coldly ignored him. Go in a rain again, he said to the world in general. If you'll, uh, excuse me contradicting of you, Robert, said William. I heard the milkman saying it was going to be fine. If you'll excuse me contradicting of you. Look here, said Robert angrily. Lesser your cheek. Seems to me no one in this house understands what being polite is, said William bitterly. Seems to me one might go on being polite in this house for years and no one know what one was doing. His mother looked at him anxiously. You're, you're feeling quite well, uh, dear, aren't you? You haven't got a headache or anything, have you? She said. No. I'm being polite, he said irritably, then pulled himself up suddenly. I'm quite well, thank you, mother dear, he said in a tone of cloying sweetness. Does it hurt you much? inquired his brother tenderly. No, thank you, Robert, said William politely. After breakfast, he received his pocket money with courteous gratitude. Thank you very much, father. Not at all. Pray don't mention it, William. It's quite all right, said Mr. Brown, not to be outdone. Then, he's rather trying. How long does it last? What? The resolution. Oh, being polite. He said they didn't often do it after the first day. He's quite right, whoever he is, said Mr. Brown. They don't. He's going to ask her again, volunteered William. Who ask who what? said Mr. Brown, but William had departed. He was already on his way to Mr. Moss's shop. Mr. Moss was at the door, hatted and coated, and gazing anxiously down the street. Good morning, Mr. Moss, said William politely. Mr. Moss took out a large antique watch. He's late, he said. I shall miss the train. Oh, dear. It will be the first New Year's Day I've missed in ten years. William was inspecting the sweets with the air of an expert. Them pink ones are new, he said at last. How much are they? Eight pence and a quarter. Oh dear, I shall miss the train. They're very small ones, said William disparagingly. You'd think they'd be less than that. Small ones like that. Will you... Will you do something for me? And I'll give you a quarter of those sweets. William gasped. The offer was almost too munificent to be true. I'll do anything for that, he said simply. Well, just stay in the shop till my nephew Bill comes. He'll be here in two shakes and I'll miss my train if I don't go now. He's going to keep the shop for me till I'm back. And he'll be here any minute now. Just tell him I had to run and catch me train. And if anyone comes into the shop before he comes, just tell him to wait or come back later. You can weigh yourself a quarter of those sweets. Mr. Moss 
You are certainly in a holiday mood. William pinched himself just to make sure that he was still alive and had not been translated suddenly to the realms of the blessed. Mr. Moss, with a last anxious glance at his watch, hurried off in the direction of the station. William was left alone. He spent a few minutes indulging in a roseate of daydreams, the ideal of his childhood, perhaps of everyone's childhood, was realised. He had a sweet shop. He walked around the shop with a conscious swagger, pausing to pop into his mouth a butter ball, composed, as the label stated, of pure farm cream and best butter was all his. All these rows and rows of gleaming bottles of sweets of every size and colour, those boxes and boxes of attractively arranged chocolates. Deliberately, he imagined himself as the owner. By the time he had walked around the shop three times, he believed that he was the owner. At this point, a small boy appeared in the doorway. William scowled at him. Well, he said ungraciously, what do you want? Then, suddenly remembering his resolution, please, what do you want? Where's uncle? said the small boy, with equal ungraciousness. Because our Bill's ill, and can't come. William waved him off. That's all right. You tell him that's all right, that's quite all right. See? Now, you go off. The small boy stood as though rooted to the spot. William pressed into his hands a stick of licorice, and into the other hand a packet of chocolate. Now you go away. I don't want you here. See? You go away, you little assified cow. William's invective was often wholly original. The small boy made off. Still staring at and clutching his spoils, William started to the door and yelled to the retreating figure, If you don't mind me saying so! He had already come to look upon the resolution as a kind of god who must at all costs be propitiated. Already the resolution seemed to have bestowed upon him the dream of his life, a fully equipped sweet shop. He wandered around again, and discovered a wholly new sweetmeat called Coconut Kisses. Its only drawback was its instability. It melted away in the mouth at once, so much so that, almost before William was aware of it, he was confronted by the empty box. He returned to the more solid charms of the pineapple crisp. He was interrupted by the entrance of a thin lady of uncertain age. Good morning, she said icily. Where's Mr. Moss? William answered, as well as the presence of five sweets in his mouth would allow. I can't hear a word you say, she said, more frigidly than ever. William removed two of his five sweets and placed them temporarily on the scale. Gone, he said laconically, then murmured vaguely, thank you, as the thought of the resolution loomed up in his mind. Who's in charge? Me, said William ungrammatically. She looked at him with distinct disapproval. Well, I'll have one of those bars of chocolates. William, looking around the shop, realised suddenly that his own depredations had been on no small scale, but there was a chance of making good on any loss that Mr. Moss might otherwise have sustained. He looked down at the two penny bars. Shilling each, he said firmly. She gasped. <gasps> they were only two pence yesterday. They've uh, gone up since said William brazenly, adding a vague, if you'll uh, kindly excuse me saying so. Gone up! 
she repeated indignantly. Had you heard from the makers they had gone up? Yes, said William politely. When did you hear? This morning, if you don't mind me saying so. William's manner of fulsome politeness seemed to madden her. Did you hear by post? Yes, ma'am. By post this morning. She glared at him with vindictive triumph. I happen to live opposite, you wicked lying boy, and I know that the postman did not call here this morning. William met her eye calmly. No, they came round here to see me in the night, the makers did. You couldn't have heard them, he added hastily. It was when you was asleep, if you'll excuse me contradicting of you. It is a great gift to be able to lie so as to convince other people. It is still a greater gift to be able to lie so as to convince oneself. William was possessed of the latter gift. I shall certainly not pay more than two pence, said his customer severely, taking a bar of chocolate and laying down two pence on the counter. And I shall report this shop to the profiteering committee. It is scandalous, and a pack of wicked lies. William scowled at her. They're a shilling, he said. I don't want your nasty old tuppences. I said there was shilling. He followed her to the door. She was crossing the street to her house. You old feet, he yelled after her, though true to his resolution. He added softly with a dogged determination, If you don't mind me saying so, I'll set the police on you. His late customer shouted angrily back across the street, You wicked blasphemous boy! William put his tongue out at her, then returned to the shop and closed the door. Here he discovered that the door, when opened, rang a bell and, after filling his mouth with licorice all sorts, he spent the next five minutes vigorously opening and shutting the door till something went wrong with the mechanism of the bell. At this he fortified himself with a course of naughty footballs, and, standing on a chair, began to ruthlessly dismember the bell. He was disturbed by the entry of another customer. Swallowing a naughty football whole, he hastened to his post behind the counter. The newcomer was a little girl of about nine, a very dainty little girl, dressed in a white fur coat and cap and long white gaiters. Her hair fell in golden curls over her white fur shoulders. Her eyes were blue. Her cheeks were velvety and rosy. Her mouth was like a baby's. William had seen this vision on various occasions in the town, but had never yet addressed it. Whenever he had seen it, his heart in the midst of his body had been even as melting wax. He smiled, a self-conscious, sheepish smile. His freckled face blushed to the roots of his short, stubby hair. She seemed to find nothing odd in the fact of a small boy being in charge of a sweet shop, she came up to the counter. Please, I want two two-penny bars of chocolate. Her voice was very clear and silvery. Ecstasy rendered William speechless. His smile grew wider and more foolish. Seeing his two half-sucked pineapple crisps exposed on the scales, he hastily put them into his mouth. She laid four pennies on the counter. William found his voice. You you can have lots for that, he said, huskily. They've gone cheap. They've gone ever so cheap. You can take all the box full for that, he went on recklessly. He pressed the box into her reluctant hands. And uh, what else would you like? You just tell me that. Tell me what else you'd like. Please, I haven't any more money, gasped a small, bewildered voice. Money don't matter, said William. Things is cheap today. Things is awful cheap today, awful cheap. You can have anything you like for that four pence, anything you like. Because it's 
New Year's Day, said the vision, with a gleam of understanding. Yes, William said. Cause it's that. Is it your shop? Yes, said William, with an air of importance. It's all my shop. She gazed at him in admiration and envy. I'd love to have a sweet shop, she said wistfully. Well, you take anything you like, said William generously. She collected as much as she could and started towards the door. Thank you. Thank you ever so, she said gratefully. William stood leaning against the door in the easy attitude of a good-natured, all-providing male. It's all right, he said with an indulgent smile. Quite all right, quite all right. Then, with an inspiration, born of memories of his father earlier in the day. Not at all. Don't mention it. Not at all. Quite all right. He stopped, simply for lack of further expressions, and bowed with would-be gracefulness as she went through the doorway. As she passed the window, she was rewarded by a spreading, effusive smile in a flushed face. She stopped and kissed her hand. William blinked, pure emotion. He continued his smile long after its recipient had disappeared. Then, absent-mindedly, he crammed his mouth with a handful of mixed dewdrops and sat down behind the counter. As he crunched mixed dewdrops, he indulged in a daydream in which he rescued the little girl in the white fur coat from robbers and pirates and a burning house. He was just leaping nimbly from the roof of the burning house, holding the little girl in the white fur coat in his arms, when he caught sight of two of his friends, flattening their noses at the window. He rose from his seat and went to the door. Hello, Ginger. Hello, Henry, he said, with an unsuccessful effort to appear void of self-consciousness. They gazed at him in wonder. I've got a shop, he went on casually. Come in and look at it. They peeped around the doorway cautiously, and, reassured by the sight of William, obviously in sole possession, they entered, open-mouthed. They gazed at the boxes and bottles of sweets. Aladdin's cave was nothing to this. How'd you get it, William? gasped Ginger. Someone gave it to me, said William. I took one of them, uh, things to be polite, and someone gave it to me. Go on, he said, kindly. Just help yourselves. Not at all, just help yourselves. Don't mention it. They needed no second bidding. With the unerring instinct of childhood, not unsupported by experience, that at any minute their Eden might be invaded by the avenging angel in the shape of a grown-up, they made full use of their time. They went box to box, putting handfuls of sweets and chocolates into their mouths. They said nothing, simply because speech was, under the circumstances, a physical impossibility, showing a foresight for the future worthy of the noble and itself. So often held up as a model to childhood, they filled their pockets in the intervals of cramming their mouths. A close observer might have noticed that William now ate little, William himself had been conscious for some time of a curious and inexplicable feeling of coldness towards the tempting dainties around him. He was, however, loath to give in to the weakness, and every now and then he nonchalantly put into his mouth a toasted square or a fruity bit. It happened that a loutish boy of fourteen was passing the shop. At the sight of three small boys rapidly consuming the contents, he became interested. "'What you doing of?' he said indignantly, standing in the doorway. "'You get out of my shop,' said William valiantly. "'Your shop?' said the boy. "'You're blooming well pinching things out of someone else's shop. "'I can see. Here, give me some of them.' "'You get out,' said William. "'Get out yourself,' said the other. "'If I'd not took one to be polite,' said William threateningly, I'd knock you down. You would, would you? Said the other, beginning to roll up his sleeves. Yes, and I would too. You get out. 
seizing the nearest bottle, which happened to contain acid drops. He began to fire them at his opponent's head. One of them hit him in the eye. He retired to the street. William, now a fire for battle, followed him, still hurling acid drops with all his might. A crowd of boys collected together. Some gathered acid drops from the gutter. Others joined the scrimmage. William, Henry and Ginger carried on a noble fight against heavy odds. It was only the sight of the proprietor of the shop coming briskly down the sidewalk that put an end to the battle. The boys made off, with what spoils they could gather, in one direction, and Ginger and Henry in another. William, clasping an empty acid drop bottle to his bosom, was left to face Mr. Moss. Mr. Moss looked round with an air of bewilderment. "'Where's Bill?' he said. "Er, uh, he's ill,' said William. "'He couldn't come. I've been keeping a shop for you. I've done the best I could.' He looked around the rifled shop and hastened to propitiate the owner as far as possible. "'I've got some money for you,' he added soothingly, pointing to the four pennies that represented his morning's takings. "'It's, er, uh, it's not much.' He went on with some truth, looking at the rows of emptied boxes and half-emptied bottles and the debris that is always and everywhere the inevitable result of a battle. But Mr. Moss hardly seemed to notice. "'Thanks, William,' he said almost humbly. "'William, she's took me. She's going to marry me. Isn't it grand? After all these years? Uh, I I'm afraid there's a bit of a mess.' said William, returning to the more important matter. Mr. Moss waved aside his apologies. "'It don't matter, William,' he said. "'Nothing matters today. She's took me at last. I'm going to shut this shop this afternoon and go over to her again. Thanks for staying, William. Not at all. Don't mention it,' said William nobly. "'Then I think I've had enough of being polite.' Will one morning do for this year, do you think? Er, uh, yes. Well, I'll shut up. Don't you stay, William. You'll want to be getting home for lunch. Lunch? Quite definitely, William decided that he did not want any lunch. The very thought of lunch brought with it a feeling of active physical discomfort, which was much more than a mere absence of hunger. He decided to go home as quickly as possible, although not to lunch. "'Goodbye,' he said. "'Goodbye,' said Mr. Moss. "'Er, uh, I'm afraid you'll find some things gone,' said William faintly. "'Some boys was in.' "'That's all right, William,' said Mr. Moss, "'rousing again from his rosy dreams. "'That's quite all right. "'But it was not quite all right with William, dear reader.' If you had been left at the age of eleven in sole charge of a sweet shop for a whole morning, would it have been all right with you? I trow not. But we will not follow William through the humiliating hours of the afternoon. We will leave him as pale and unsteady, but as yet master of the situation, he wends his homeward way. 